Another thing that Lewis did, which ensures his continuing success, at least for the time being until others come along who are better at it, is his ability to encapsulate the Christian faith in short, pithy, almost proverbial-like sentences or maxims. He was uh, so adept at this that many of these quotations continue to appear in writings, in sermons, even those who don't like Lewis much sometimes, websites, um, blogs, uh, letters, uh, still today. I want to read a few of them out to you. You'll know most of them if you know Lewis. But just to remind you how adept he was at putting profound things in a very short and captivating form. Here are some of them. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because I see everything by it. Miracles are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. Doesn't It's fine. <laughs> it's not important. You can never get a cup of tea large enough or a book long enough to suit me. You may not have heard that one, but uh, it's typically Lewis. We would say a cup of coffee. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in the world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. What a wonderful, evocative, simple, arresting statement. A children's story that can only be endured by children is not a good children's story at all. No book is really worth reading at the age of 10, which is not equally, and often far more, worth reading at the age of 50 and beyond. Another way of making the same point, but nicely done. Love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved one's ultimate good, as far as it can be obtained. Friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, What? You too? I thought I was the only one who thought that, or felt that, or knew that. Reason is the natural order of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. I'll come back to that hugely profound but mostly neglected statement. A young man who wishes to remain a sound atheist cannot be too careful of his reading. Lewis partly became a Christian because he read the wrong books. <laughs> they were actually the best books in the field, but they happened to be mostly by Christians, which is why he often said, we don't need more books about Christianity, we need more good books by Christians in all sorts of fields of endeavour because that's the way he had partly come to faith. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will not get either. <laughs> Experience is that most brutal of teachers. But you learn. My God, you learn. You may not have heard of this one, which is not unrelated. Failures are our finger posts on the road to achievement. And you know this famous one. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that far better. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. The homemaker has the ultimate career. 
All other careers exist for one purpose only, and that is to support the ultimate career. You probably haven't heard that statement. That's a revolutionary statement in the year 2015. The homemaker is the ultimate career. I'm nearly finished, but I can't resist one or two more. Hmm. There are only two kinds of people in the, in, um, in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. I just choose two last ones. Uh, you may not know either of these. Hmm. There often seems no plan, because it is all plan. There often seems no plan, because it is all plan. When you have, when you have found your own room, be kind to those who have chosen different doors, and to those who are still outside in the hall. These are just a few of some of uh, Lewis's key quotes. A fourth and final reason, uh, after which I want to say something else by way of conclusion a little differently, uh, but a fourth and final reason why Lewis continues to live and continues to have something to say to us is that he believed that the basic way in which we could come to faith and grow in faith lay with connecting to our deepest longings and to evoke those in the most compelling imaginative way. I'll fill that out, I hope, in a way that makes sense. Hmm. Lewis is primarily honoured because he is somebody who is so reasonable. The cognitive dimension of Christianity is something which he understands, which he stressed, and which he was so powerful at presenting to others. And there's no doubt that throughout his writings he frequently provides arguments based on very clearly stated criteria for anything that he is arguing for. He believed that Christianity was more reasonable than its alternatives and that anyone who had an openness to think, and you didn't have to be a great thinker to do it, would have the capacity to see that. But Lewis didn't stop there and ultimately was not what was most basic to his whole approach, even though it's often said to be. Lewis also speaks not just to our cognitive faculties, but to our emotions. In fact, he himself said in one of his more academic writings, one of the most important and effective uses of language is the emotional. We do not only talk in order to reason or inform. His autobiography, um, or at least autobiographical account of how he came to faith, is, as you know, entitled Surprised by Joy. And joy for him, whatever else it was, was something absolutely emotionally central to his life. It was not only that, but it was certainly um, at heart uh, that as well as other things. And so throughout his writings... Lewis is constantly appealing to the feelings, the affections of his readers. All you have to do is open any book of Lewis and you don't have to open a fictional book uh, or one of his theological fantasies like The Great Divorce or the Screwtape Letters to, uh, to do this. It's just to, to look at how often the words he uses have an emotional force or impact. He doesn't do it uh, because he wants to shock people or um, he wants to uh, 
uh, somehow seduce people emotionally, or certainly not manipulatively. It's just that for him, words are emotional as well as uh, rational tools, and they must be used in a way that conveys both aspects of the truth. Truth has to be something which is not only reasonable, but it has to be something which is emotionally validated as well by what is deepest within us. So even in his most didactic essays and writings, you will find all sorts of language of this kind. But the most powerful way to evoke feelings, and for Lewis the most powerful way ultimately to convince people about the truth of something, is to speak to them imaginatively. And that is what he does from the beginning to end of everything he actually wrote. It's there from his earliest writings. The Pilgrim's Regress was the first book he ever wrote, and although there's a lot of philosophy in it, uh, it's uh, an imaginative writing which plays a little off John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. The space fiction, science fiction series, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Great Divorce, the Screwtape Letters, his last book, Till We Have Faces, let alone others we could mention of a more so-called didactic kind, Mere Christianity, Miracles, The Problem of Pain. When you look at them closely, something more is going on than pure argumentation. Austin Farrer observed of the book Problem of Pain after carefully reading it, which he did because he was writing a book on pain at the same time. He actually made a witty comment at some point about uh, Lewis's book. He said, um, it's enough to have to suffer pain without having to read a book by C.S. Lewis on the subject. <laughs> uh, but although he didn't fully agree with the book, he actually felt it was a fine piece of writing. And as he says, we think in this book we are listening to an argument, but in fact we are being presented with a vision and it is the vision that ultimately carries conviction. You can read it as an argument, but you'll find that more and more as you read, Lewis is building an imaginative picture of what Christianity is all about and how it actually uh, answers the basic questions raised by suffering in this world. The fact that the book has that capacity was tested by C.E.M. Joad, the most popular British philosopher uh, of the day, an atheist and then agnostic for much of his early philosophical life, who read The Problem of Pain and became a Christian through it, and said at the end, I didn't get all the answers to the questions that I had about the reality of suffering and pain in this world, which is just so inescapable and brutal. But C.S. Lewis helped me to walk several paces across the room so that I could look at it from a different angle, and then the whole subject began to look different. That was the impact of that particular book. Lewis, of course, wanted not only to appeal to people's emotions or to uh, galvanise their imaginations. In fact, he said at one point, like the Catholic uh, philosopher, apologist Christopher Dorfin, Christianity was lost in the West from around the 1800s when Christian writers failed to appeal to people's imaginations and present them with a whole vision, a whole world view of life that would continue to keep the Christian option open for them to believe in. And that's why he also said, as Dawson said, uh, if we want to win the battle for the gospel, we have to present to people an, a, a vision of the whole of life, a worldview which breaks them out of the little everyday secular or materialist box in which they live most of their lives, which prevents them even seeing that there's something more out there. All the arguments in the world, all the evidence you throw at them means nothing so long as they see it in this box. 
You've got to get them into the bigger box. That would be the greatest apologetic service anybody could offer. Yes, he wanted people to do that, but he wanted them ultimately, of course, to make a decision. He had a long conversation with Billy Graham once about decisions and decision-making in the Christian life, and he wasn't sure that Graham's was the only way to do it, but they certainly agreed on the fact that making a decision for God was basic to becoming a Christian, as had already happened in Lewis's own life in his early 30s. And you know that lovely scene um, in one of the chronicles in which Lucy appears by a stream and Aslan is there and she's somewhat overcome, intimidated. Are you thirsty? Are you not thirsty, said the lion? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. Uh, may I, may, could, could I, uh, would you mind just going away while I do that, said Jill? The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. I, I, I daren't come and drink, she said. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, <laughs> said the lion. Too often we seek to argue people into the Christian faith or simply sort of out-experience them through telling our testimony of one kind or another to them. It's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. We need to go further. We need to be able to, in our own small way, find ways of appealing to what are their deepest longings and appealing to what are their most potential creative imaginations. Sure if we are to make any real progress in this whole area. I should add, of course, that Lewis not only wrote imaginatively, but that virtually every sentence, certainly every paragraph he wrote, was full of imaginative terms, similes, metaphors, analogies, symbols, all sorts of ways in which language comes alive and uh, connects people much more uh, closely and, and fully with it. This has not always been realised uh, by people who, um, who look at Lewis, but increasingly it's uh, becoming accepted. Let me give just one example um, of the way Lewis can do this. He talks in his letters to Malcolm about the way in which the most ordinary and homely, familiar, we would say, aspects of life can become tiny theophanies or patches of godlight. That's Lewis's phrase, patches of godlight. It's a beautiful little phrase. Um, he says, I can't hear the song of a bird simply as a sound. Its meaning or message comes with inevitably as something more, in a visual way. When the wind roars, when the wind roars, I don't just hear the roar. I hear something more. There is a pleasure. There is an echo of another world to it. All these things are whispers of the country from which they originate. They are messages. We know we are being touched by a finger of that right hand at which there are pleasures evermore. Any patch of sunlight in a wood will show you something about the sun which you could never get from reading books on astronomy. Such pure and spontaneous pleasures are patches of godlight in the woods of our experience. Lewis, wherever he walked, wherever he looked, wherever he heard, wherever he touched, had his eyes, ears, 
fingers alert to what was in front of him as something which is not just there, but as something which came as a sign, a message from somewhere else beyond this world. Everywhere around him, he was able to open, or God opened for him, little windows into the meaning of God's realm, the kingdom of God. The everyday and the spiritual, the ordinary and the extraordinary, the natural and the supernatural, were just wafer-thin apart for Lewis throughout his whole waking hours, life, from beginning to end. It's not widely known that Lewis, during the 30-odd years he lived with Mrs. Moore in the Kewans outside Oxford, was a kind of house husband. He wasn't her husband, but he looked after her because her son Paddy had died in the First World War, and he and Paddy had promised each other if either of them died, they would look after each other's parents. Lewis bought a house, installed her in it, and her daughter Maureen, and continued to look after her for the rest of her life until she died. In the course of that, whenever Mrs. Moore called out and wanted something done, he stopped whatever he was doing, even re writing the most important academic book, or Me Christianity, or the Chronicles of Narnia, instantly stopped and attended to it, never once failing to do it. When she wanted him to do all sorts of household chores around the place as she got older because she was less able to do it, he never, never once, according to his brother Warney, complained. Just went and did it. He washed dishes. He cleaned floors. He did shopping down in the local supermarket. Uh, he did all these things, and others as well, as part of his everyday existence for the whole of his life. Many people would say that was a waste of time. He should have got on with doing the real stuff. I've heard people say it. I've heard Sikh preachers say it. <laughs> we were both at a meeting once when one of the leading pastors in the city said, oh, I never do any cleaning. I never clean toilets or anything like that. I leave that to my wife while I get on with my ministry. <laughs> if, only, if only he had read C.S. Lewis. Because here's the most extraordinary, but not really extraordinary thing. It was because Lewis was willing to do all those very mundane, ordinary, petty things that he learned a language which enabled him to speak to a whole generation or two or three of people whose lives are full of those things because he was able to frame the most profound Christian truths in and through those everyday chore-like, housework-type things that he was doing. Pick up any page of mere Christianity and you will find images drawn from what we call everyday life. Somebody has done the, um, the service of reading through mere Christianity and pulling together the little word pictures that occur in that one book for conversion. Here they are. I've got to read them quickly because there are a lot. It's like falling at someone's feet or putting yourself in someone's hands, like taking on board fuel or food. It's like surrendering. It's like saying sorry. It's like laying yourself open. It's like turning around. It's like killing a part of yourself. It's like learning to walk or to write. It's like buying a present with your own money, uh, with God's money. It's like a drowning man clutching at a rescuer's hand. It's like a tin soldier or statue becoming alive. It's like waking up after a long sleep, like getting close to someone or becoming infected. It's like dressing up or pretending to play. It's like emerging from the womb or hatching from an egg. It's like a compass needle swinging to the north or a cottage being made into a palace or a field being ploughed and resown, or a hearse turning into a pegasus or a greenhouse roof becoming bright in the sunlight. It's like coming around from the outer city. It's like coming out from the wind. It's like going home. It's as if Lewis is saying, look at it this way. If that doesn't work, look at it that way. 
If that doesn't do it for you, hey, here's another way of looking at it. And by the way, I've got 20 or 30 more in my swag. You can have any one of them that you wish. This is in one single book about one single truth. Extraordinary. Yes, but not because Lewis had learned naturally to do this. He didn't invent these. He didn't go around looking for illustrations to pepper his talks or books any more than he went around looking for humorous jokes to tell, despite what he was saying. No, it was part of who he was. It was part of the way he thought, part of the way he saw life, part of the way he actually talked, naturally, without any additional working at it at all. That's the extraordinary thing about Lewis here. How amazing, by the way, that he came up as his central symbol, the, uh, the picture of a lion. He didn't think his way to it. He said that when he began writing the Narnia Chronicles, in which Aslan initially played no part, it started with a picture of a fawn by, a, by um, a light in the wood, a lamp in the wood. He said Aslan bounded into it. He just sprang in. Where? Well, from there. Sprang in from outside. He just sprang in. But he immediately recognised that this was the key symbol that he could use, the key way of depicting the central character in the story. And that has proved so absolutely compelling for generations of people. I encourage you, challenge you to sit down and think for one hour about another animal that would do as a symbol for Aslan better than a lion. You can get close with a few, but really you can't improve on it. And of course, little did uh, Lewis know that uh, as we learned from our visit to the history of Singapore in the National Museum, National Museum last week, that the lion was the symbol of Singapore little providential touch there, Lewis didn't know. He may have known that the lion was a symbol of uh, Venice, but I don't think he knew about Singapore. So all of this, Lewis wrapped up in ordinary conversation. As people have said, his books read like a good conversation. It's not like somebody declaring or presenting or preaching or teaching you. You're in the room and somebody is talking to you. Many people, in a book that uh, uh, pulls together about 20-odd people who are deeply influenced by it, would say things like this, that as I was reading this book, I felt like he was in the room talking just to me. Or they say something like, uh, as I was reading this book, I felt befriended by him. Befriended by him. A friendly conversationalist. What a wonderful aspiration for anyone who wants to share the faith with other people to have, to become a friendly conversationalist. I conclude. I've talked about Lewis's writings, Lewis, Lewis, uh, Lewis's works. But... Behind all that lay Lewis the man. Douglas Gresham, his stepson, we both heard say about uh, C.S. Lewis, Lewis was the most thoroughly converted man I have ever met. I didn't call him Lewis, he called him Jack. Lewis is a uh, name by which he was known to people who knew him best. The most thoroughly converted man. And yet, as Bede Griffiths, a friend of Lewis, has said, throughout his life he affected to be just a plain, ordinary man, not to be different to anybody else. Plain Jack Lewis, as he used to refer to himself. And this desire to be an ordinary person, even though he was in many ways an extraordinary one, was what lay at the, at the heart of his ability to talk to a whole range of people at all levels of society. He spoke to teachers, he spoke to people in the armed forces, he spoke to uh, lay people, he spoke to children. He, uh, he got on extremely well uh, with children in, in a whole set of ways. 
And in all these respects, um, Lewis commended himself. He was also a humble person. Occasionally he had flashes of pride and he would own up to them. He was a little intimidating in conversation now and again because his passion led him astray. But basically he listened carefully, he responded uh, in ways which were sensitive, and as people we have talked to who know Lewis and went for walks with him in the fields would say, um, it was just like talking to somebody who was on the same level with you. He had this deep humility. And above all of that, how extraordinary that an Oxford Don, one of the most uh, distinguished professors of his day, should spend years of his life writing for children. Not only for children, but for children. Why? Because he was able to let the child within come out and talk on the page. And not only able to do it, that's one thing, but willing to do it publicly in a way which he discovered led only to others laughing at him, feeling that there was something wrong with him, suggesting that he was psychologically somehow immature and, in the long run, preventing him from getting the most prestigious chair in Oxford, which everybody said he was the one who should have obtained it because he wrote some children's literature which a really serious Oxford Don should never, ever do. As Richard Cunningham says, and rightly then of his book on Lewis the Apologist, Lewis was his own finest apology. Thank you.